All right, thanks everyone for your patience and welcome to the machine learning challenge session for the rest of this afternoon. I'm going to go very quickly through this since we're a little bit uh, behind time now and try and make up some time. Uh, although there is a, a very long history of the application of machine learning to biological data, both generally and specifically within this community, we are really uh, seeing in the last few years an exponential growth, and that exponential growth manifests in the available data, in the uh, computational power and upper bound of the power of the models that we're seeing, and an explosion in the number of methods as well. It's truly exciting times for the application of ML to biological data. I thought just to give a bit of context to the sessions that you'll see uh, following this, that I would give a, a little bit of a framework about how we conceptually divide the types of machine learning models and applications that we see, specifically with respect to uh, immune repertoire data. At a high level, we first typically divide machine learning models in this area based on the type of input data that they deal with. And in particular, a uh, central division that we rely on is uh, the division between those models which apply to repertoire level data and make predictions at a subject level, or those models which apply to sequence or chronotype level data and make predictions for individual sequences. With repertoire level models, we typically see that they take uh, entire repertoires or subsampled or subsets of repertoires as their input, as well as subject metadata. Uh, we've seen a lot of methods applied to this, and the uh, methods have really evolved over the years, uh, starting more initially with things like multiple instance learning and uh, attention networks, to more recently a lot of use of autoencoders, especially variational autoencoders. And the applications for which you'll typically see these types of models are really uh, very focused on disease diagnosis, uh, predicting disease severity. I'm sure we all saw lots of these come out during the SARS-CoV-2 uh, era, and also predicting immunization status. When it comes to sequence or chronotype level modeling, uh, we enter a world where we have two human abstractions which we can potentially use as input data. We have one-dimensional sequence data, and we have three-dimensional structure data available to us. This has really defined the set of models which people have used to approach these problems. Uh, with the sequence data being one-dimensional, a lot of inspiration has been taken from visual processing and language processing fields, applying things like CNNs, RNNs, and most recently, a lot of large language model approaches. Whereas on the structure side, we've seen uh, the 3D inputs more readily applied to uh, the types of models that we see with GNNs, point cloud nets, diffusion models, and flow-based models, especially more recently. But one thing that's been a very interesting development over the last few years is that this isn't such a stark divide anymore. We now have models for protein folding, which are very well known and ubiquitous, which allow us to translate from a sequence input to a structure output. And we have the inverse as well, what we call inverse folding models, which allow us to take a structure as input and predict the sequence that would fold into that structure. We now have also seen models which are able to co-design both sequence and structure, so we're really seeing less of a divide uh, between these two input modalities uh, than previously seen. One other important division to keep in mind is not just the model inputs, but the model outputs as well. And in this case, we see two broad classes uh, that you may want to keep in mind. Property prediction models, and these may be binary or regression-based models. These are used often for predicting functional properties of the immune receptors, such as their affinity, neutralization potential, or immunogenicity. Intrinsic developability properties, like thermostability, expression aggregation, and polyspecificity. And these are all thus far sequence-level predictions, uh, but as well 
There are models which apply predictions at an individual residue level for predicting things like solvent accessibility or humanness of the sequence. On the other hand, uh, we have generative models. These have been applied again for some time, going back to generative adversarial models and older uh, iterations of this, but have really exploded in recent times, especially with the introduction of the large language models and the diffusion models and with inspiration from text and image generation uh, more broadly in the machine learning community. I think we can broadly group these generative models together into several subcategories. We have what we would typically in ML refer to as unconditional generative models. These are models which generate uh, immune receptor, either sequences or structures, with no particular input or bias, typically with just a, a noise input. On the other hand, we have conditional generation, uh, which is of particular interest for uh, therapeutics discovery, for example, where we may want to conditionally generate sequences which would bind to an interesting cognate therapeutic tar target. We may want to condition on particular developability properties or ranges of properties, uh, or we may want to condition on a particular parent sequence and mutate uh, away from that parent wild type. There are lots of applications of generative models, and I think this is an area of uh, particular interest in research at the moment. We've seen applications, of course, in affinity maturation against particular targets, in humanizing sequences, especially in humanizing uh, VHH and camelid sequences, in liability reduction uh, during the therapeutics development, and uh, various other parts uh, of the discovery and optimization process. So we've got an incredible agenda lined up for the rest of the afternoon. Uh, we are very lucky to have people working really at the forefront of almost all areas uh, of this field. Uh, we will quickly go through the remainder of this agenda punctuated by a coffee break. And then uh, we will finally have a couple of selected spotlight talks, uh, which have come from our poster presenters. So uh, without further ado, I think we'd better kick off into our first session uh, with uh, Professor Jeffrey Gray of Johns Hopkins University and director of the Rosetta Commons, uh, who will be presenting on artificial intelligence tools for antibody engineering. 